After nearly 20 years, I was down to the last week on the job, kind of like this. I'd been a biology professor at a community college, and I was leaving to finish seminary, to finish the last bit of my education and transformation. The cost of this pursuit was high, and the, uh, was including the loss of income and identity. But I was happy, and it showed. Then Dave, an administrator with, let's just say, a corner office, stopped by my not corner office to drop off a letter. He said, I couldn't say it, so I wrote it. We'd been through good times and trying times together. In truth, though, the letter wasn't for me. It was for him. He wrote, Linda, you are true to yourself. You're doing what you love. And I've been thinking of doing something similar myself. Then he wrote, I envy your courage. He's still there. Nothing has changed for him except that I now know he yearns for something different. You're not a troubled guest on this earth. You are not an accident amidst accidents. I love these lines from the poem, you are not a troubled guest. What urgency calls you to your one true love? This is an invitation, a call to the thing tender and precious that is yours. It's what now requires your attention. It's an understanding or a longing that we find ourselves coming back to again and again, like the thing you wake up to before the rational mind demands you make plans. It's an invitation reminding you that you have a role to play in determining your own life, in manifesting your expression of the universe. I say this because we are life expressing itself for this one shining moment. It will be gone, my friends. This does not last. It's a timeless call for us to recognize and embody our authentic selves. It's our invitation to step into the fullness of being. And if we don't, if we don't, we succumb to the seductive safety of our fears. Refusing over and over again to be true to ourselves, we suffer. Brené Brown, author and expert researcher into vulnerability, isn't that an awesome job? Hi, I'm an expert on vulnerability. Show me yours. <laughs> she reports, she reports that we suffer when we trade authenticity for safety. When we do that, she suggests that we are more apt to experience, and it's a long list, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, addiction, rage, blame, resentment, and inexplicable grief. Brown is not alone in her analysis of this. Quaker theologian and author Parker Palmer understands the call to, the authentic li the call to our authentic lives to be something to which we should return to again and again. He suggests that we are born whole. Genuine, our infant selves are true to their expressions. But as we grow, we become subject to the expectations of our people and our culture. The expectations may be gently placed on our young shoulders as children or not so gently placed on our shoulders by societal expectations about what activities, occupations, and or relationships are most valued. Maybe these messages become incorporated into your self-talk and sound like this. Be quiet. Be brave. Be smart. Stay. Leave. Change. When this happens, we become divided because we soon lear le learned the fear and shame of not belonging. We fear that our authentic selves are not acceptable, and so we pass 
gay, lesbian, and especially transgendered people know what this is about to pass. But we all suffer this to some degree. We lose our identity and our integrity, the true gifts we were born with. And I could easily argue, too, that this loss of self is essential for a well-functioning society. So I don't want to place blame here. We absorb and self-impose these shoulds on others, on each others, and ourselves quite naturally. But we can be more discerning. Palmer invites us to revisit the possibility of living an authentic life. He offers that if we do, we will not only live a more joyful life, but we will better serve the world when we offer the world our unique gifts. Our clear call to faith can help us do that. I had a call to my unique self, my own way of understanding the world, when I was a chaplain at the trauma center here at Methodist Hospital. I was there for the summer. I was part of an interfaith group, group a learning cohort. We were Lutheran, Presbyterian, Unitarian, Universalist, and Catholic. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> Being the only one who did not identify as Christian, I really did feel out of place. I question how I fit in as a person of faith when my colleagues seem to have such clear and defined relationship to a higher power, to Jesus, to God. They understood heaven and salvation. Ironically, though, it was my Catholic colleague that made clear to me what my faith called me to do how my faith required me to pay attention to how I am in the world. I was ready to go home after being on call in the hospital for 12 hours. I was finishing the evening shift, having witnessed the traumas that always play out there, emergencies, crises, and death. It was a place of ultimacy. Brother Dave had come to relieve me. He was on the dreaded night shift. I liked Dave a lot. In fact, I love Dave. As I made my way out the door, I was saying, good night, Dave. I'm out of here. As I kept walking, I heard his response, good night, you, you doubter. <laughs> he said this as a loving joke, and I was amused for a moment, but then I stopped in my tracks standing squarely in the hospital hallway, and it was empty. Unable to see him, I knew he was wrong. I stood considering his remark, and I knew he didn't understand me, but in that moment, I understood me. I walked back and explained, Dave, I don't doubt. I don't need to know. I don't need to know. I told him that it wasn't imperative for me, required or even necessarily desirable, that I answer these theological questions. Is there a God? Is there an afterlife, a heaven, or God forbid, a hell? <laughs> My faith instead compels me to live this life as fully as I can in this one known moment. Doubt, I realized, was not my problem. My mission, if you will, was living fully, not knowing the answers. Not to hesitate because I did not know. This was Dave's gift to me. The gift was clarity of faith. It was a call to live an authentic life, not knowing where it would take me. What was the goal, the gift, the heart of the sacred thing for me? Especially, that is the not knowing. Not knowing where it would take me. This call was to let go of my need for certainty. The reason this works for me in my faith is because it invites me to be in this moment, in this life, to be my best self now. It invites us to recognize and nurture our unique selves today. 
Imagine, if you can, that you were born, you are born, with a unique set of talents and proclivities and passions, but that few are fully expressed. You are your own artist. Michelangelo said, I saw an angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. Imagine if we saw our lives as the marble and our striving to be our authentic selves as the carving, the action that sets free our better angels, sets free our true self. Isn't this life's work? And if we fail, I can use religious language here too. We sin. The Hebrew word for sin literally means to miss the mark. It's a reference to missing the mark in archery. So you pull out an arrow, you pull, what is that? The bow. You like, I missed the mark, right? It falls short. What do you do? You pull another one, you try again, okay? So in the context of the call to authenticity today, I think it is a sin, a missing of the mark, not to follow our callings, not to recognize our true selves, our angels in the marble. Because when we do this, we deny each other and ourselves our true gifts, regardless of just how unacceptable or impractical they may first appear. In my position as biology professor, I witnessed over and over again how people struggle with this. Nate sat in my office. I was his advisor. He had told me when we first met that he wanted to become a veterinarian. It's a very common pre-major, by the way. I want to work with animals, my students would often say, and weary of it, I would think to myself, Yeah, but are you willing to do the surgery? He sat in my biology class miserable. He earned a D the first semester and did not improve the second. I didn't feel comfortable continuing to pretend that it was all going to be okay. We were there to register him for the next semester. He was quiet and unresponsive, and yet I just liked him. I said, Nate, understatement, you're struggling with biology. (laughs) I'm concerned, you know, vet school won't accept students with poor grades. He averted his eyes and he nodded. Then I tried something else. I took what felt like a risk and asked, what do you like doing? What do you love? There was an uncomfortable silence until he responded, I loved ceramics in high school. You mean using the kiln and such? Yeah, but you can't make a living doing that. My parents want me to become a veterinarian. Then I understood. His authentic self didn't align with what the people who best loved him wanted for him. No wonder he was quiet. He was in conflict between what the people who raised him, to whom he felt indebted, wanted for him, and what made him feel whole, alive, and capable. There was no malicious intent here. His family didn't want him to be unhappy, and he didn't harbor any great ill towards his family or their interest in his future. He wanted to honor their care of him. So it's not clear cut these decisions we make in our lives. There may be no need to respond to this conflict with anger or self-righteousness. It just is. I then invited him to take some art courses as electives. Just to feed his soul, I invited him. Just to make sure he would enjoy some of what he did. And he did. He followed his bliss. He went on to become a successful middle school art teacher. He went on to encourage youth to express themselves in art. And I learned recently that he has an exhibit of his authentic self, his art, in a local gallery. 
for Nate, if he had continued to be who he was not, I have no doubt that he would suffer. I suffered trying to help him. <laughs> and he's better for having suffered through the decision for finding the courage to be his self. And I, years ago, sitting in my office, recognizing the struggle in this young man, was just beginning to hear my call to ministry. This was Nate's gift to me. So, once you get your destination, your passion, your calling, your work has unfortunately only just begun. It's not easy or straightforward. Often keeping us from succeeding or even proceeding is the belief that we must have every step worked out before we start. You can't possibly know all you need to know already. You know that, right? Of course we can't. We need to quit thinking too much about what ifs and as Ralph Waldo Emerson put it, let the birds sing without deciphering the song. Let the birds sing without deciphering the song. Again, this gets back to my understanding of our faith. We simply don't get to know all the answers. Proceed anyway. Writer, actor, and director Naomi Newman put it this way. She says, nothing new or interesting goes in a straight line. It's the quickest way to the wrong place. Don't pretend you know where you're going. If you know where you're going, it means you've already been there. Good advice. Then, of course, when we heed these calls, when you heed the call, you will fail. I failed. We fail. Over and over again if we're doing it right. And if you're really engaging, you'll fail again. But that's okay, really. Again, Naomi Newman gives us great, great encouragement. She writes, on every fourth step, we're meant to fall down. Not occasionally, not once, not twice, but on every fourth step, the ground opens up, the wind blows, and the branch hits you on the head. You trip on stones, and your heart breaks, and you've got to fold the laundry. <laughs> They've closed the two left lanes. Here on the fourth step, all the forces gather together to stop you. And some people, when they fall down, they lie there for the rest of their lives. And some people learn how to fall down, get up. That's one move. Fall down, get up. Fall down, get up. I love that. Fall down, get up. This then asks us to trust, to take that leap of faith, to let go. This is the value of doubt, of not knowing. It makes us nimble and open to the very possibility of transformation that we cannot even yet imagine. Until more of the pieces are in place, we must often live for a while in that place of not knowing. And this, dear ones, is how we make our lives we can't know how, when we answer the call, that it will matter, that we matter. We only understand for one moment or hour or year that what we do transforms us and transforms the world, but we don't get to know it for long. We are of worth, and it is precisely because of this convoluted journey, this fall down, get up, that we cultivate compassion and change. So you're thinking, yeah, Linda, you're right, but practically speaking, I can't do it. So here's what it might look like. It doesn't always look big. In fact, it may look like a carving with the first cutting away, a small movement. Maybe it's a commitment to one thing in the coming week that feeds your soul that recognizes that which makes you feel unfettered, accomplished, or real. It might be art. It might be writing. It might be meditating. It could be working with children or going to the animal shelter because you do like animals. It could be offering to help. It might be committing to a change in your relationship. You know it because when you sit still, you hear that voice, your own small voice, telling you just 
what you need to do. Listen openly and gently to that voice. It could change your whole life. And then know what Brené Brown offers. Authenticity is a collection of choices we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen. Now imagine doing this in a way that invites others into the process. Let us link our common strengths to the greater good. What problems could we solve if our inhibitions were creatively unlocked? When we see each other's angels being released from the marble in the most unexpected ways. And this invitation doesn't stop there. To be a force that makes the world a better place, we must see the people we encounter differently. See the people you love as whole, authentic beings with their own small voices. Indeed, it is likely their uniqueness, these dear ones, that drew you to them in the first place. Have the courage to let them find their own way. Even our children, especially our children, should be loved into their whole selves. We must make space and safety for those voices to be heard. It will be painful sometimes. No doubt you will be disappointed when you hear what you did not expect. Stay with it. Your veterinarian may yet become Michelangelo. Or your, compassion, or your Michelangelo may become a brilliant veterinary scientist or a compassionate being in the world that transforms misery into hope, how will we know if we don't leave space for true knowing? So bring your best selves to the world, understanding that it's not easy. It holds no guarantees, except that if you don't, you will remain less than you might have been, less than we, our world, our culture, our children, and our planet need you to be. May it be so.